Okay, we should be live now. Okay. Bob, I'd like to convene this special meeting for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. For uh, July 13th, 2023. Holly, could you take the roll, please? President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Fulz. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. Uh, District Manager, any additions or deletions to the agenda? There are not. Okay. Um, we now move to oral communications. This part of the meeting is for members of the public that want to speak on a subject that's not on the agenda this evening that's in the district's purview. Uh, does anybody uh, want to speak on something else? Seeing two. Oh, okay. Gentlemen, uh, please step up. Do you mind if I don't because I have a bad hip and it really hurts? Okay. Okay. Certainly. We'll do this one. Uh, Luke Ferris Felton. I was reviewing the annual consumer profits report for 2022, and I noticed that all of the uh, appropriate constituents were well within spec for potable water, which is good. But I did notice that there was a what seems to be a discrepancy on the sample date for both lead and copper. Uh, for all of the cases, it was 2022. For lead and copper, it was 2020. And I find it hard to believe that we actually sampled the water two years before we tested it. So is that a typo or, or what, what's going on? Rick, um, Rick we'll look into that. Could you follow up on that? I'll we'll get back to us on that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Holloway. Thanks. I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to say. One was um, some years ago, I don't remember when it was, maybe around 2015, uh, someone in Felton wrote an op ed in the press bag, and they were advocating for a uh, bond issue as a way to uh, to pay for district capital expenses. Uh, it was not good in the press banner. Press banners meant uh, ownership has changed in the meantime. I, I'm not sure how to go find that, uh, that op-ed. It may have been attached to a board agenda that whenever it happened, but I don't know exactly when it happened either. One of the things that uh, that is good about bonds is that people, it, they are assessed on an ad valorem basis. So if you have a more valuable house, you wind up paying a higher rate for the bond. Um, and I think that's more equitable than a parcel tax that just taxes everybody equally. So I think it might be good to look into that at some point, especially with the huge capital expenses. You know, if, if not now, then, you know, sometime. Uh, another thing I wanted to say is uh, about the fish ladder. Uh, fish ladder was on page one of the Sentinel. I'm happy to see that that work is finally getting done. Um, I'm glad that our environmental uh, programs manager was able to get, uh, I'm looking for a clock somewhere. You're at one, one minute, 20 seconds. Oh, oh there, here's my there, clock. There isn't yeah. the clock that you're looking for, Mr. Holloway. It's typically on the screen. I can't explain why we don't have that this evening. Please continue. Um, so I first heard of the uh, Felton Fish Ladder from Fred McPherson when he was on the board in 2011. Um, he was asking uh, the district manager at the time uh, when we were going to do the, uh, the fish ladder. He said that it was an obligation that came with the uh, came with the Felton merger because Cal Am had already been told by the Department of Fish and Wildlife that they're going to have to fix the fish ladder. So that has been kind of an unfunded mandate for 15 years. And I'm glad that it's finally uh, being done. 
I'm glad that uh, other people that the, the grants were obtained to pay for half of the cost, but it's still costing us a million dollars, and that over a million dollars, and that is uh, some of the hangover of the Belton merger, uh, which I think is unique among all the annexations that this district has done since I've been paying attention. And I'll probably have more to say about that later. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, moving to the first item of new business, the uh, California Special Districts uh, Board of Directors election. Um, I'd like to start this one this evening, uh, a bit out of normal, but um, I reviewed the uh, qualifications for all three of the proposed uh, board members here with the uh, indication that we're supposed to vote for one. Uh, I saw that Brad E. Romero uh, is on the board for a water district, uh, which I, uh, was hopeful of that individual, but after reviewing the, the resume, mm -hmm. I was uh, underwhelmed by what he had submitted to us uh, for review. Um, the other two individuals uh, both seem very qualified, and uh, I think we would be okay with either of them uh, proceeding forward. So, uh, that, uh, I'd like to hear if any of the other board members have a thought on uh, these individuals. Uh, Bob? Uh, well, I mean, to be fair to Mr. Imanura, um he was only recently elected, yeah. right? And so he's, just a sorry, yeah. To, have a lower, right? Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, to be fair to Mr. Imanura, he was only recently ele elected to his oh. position. Um, perhaps maybe you should have waited a little bit before applying. Is, is that maybe the implication uh, that you have, Mark? Um, I mean, I appreciate the fact that he did apply and he wants to serve, and hopefully we'll maybe see him again in another uh, another application. Okay. Gail? I favor uh, a vote for the incumbent. At least I thought his uh, resume was by far the strongest. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm favoring the incumbent. Um, he's local, relatively considering the size of the state. He's local. Um, he's got a lot of experience, um, good resume. So I'm going to favor Mr. Ferranti. Jamie. I mean, the uh, truth is, I'm fine with either Mr. Ferranti or Mr. Stasi. Um, I agree. I was. I, I actually um, had a reaction to the Santa Clara Valley Water District real estate manager uh, job description that he previously held, Mr. Imamura, before he was uh, elected. And I, I have some opinions about some of the real estate deals that they did in, at, the, at that water district. So um, I was not a fan of him. But I will say, just for consideration for Mr. Stassi, because I thought he actually had the better resume personally, that the Vandenberg Village Community Services District is a water district as well. They provide a number of different utility services. So he does actually represent water conservation and water district services as part of the portfolio of the Vandenberg Village Community Services District. So just something to think about, but it sounds like we've already decided on Mr. Ferranti and I'm okay with that. Uh, I don't think we have decided on Mr. Ferrante, uh, but we've heard uh, two of the other board members mention uh, his name. So, uh, given uh, lack of any other dissension on it, uh, I'd like to uh, recommend that the board uh, vote for Vince Ferrante uh, for the CSDA uh, Board of Directors. Second. Okay. Uh, before we before we go Excuse out, me, Mark, one point of order: recommend or move. Uh, move that's Sounds right, right. Uh, since that's what our recommended motion says um, i'd like to hear from the public to see if uh, anybody has a thought on this issue seeing none here i see none uh online in the public that are meeting remotely holly would you take a vote please yes president smalley 
Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Mayhood. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, moving on then to the uh, primary topic of tonight's meeting. Um, the workshop that's the uh, rate study cost of service uh, kickoff meeting. Uh, Rick? So, well, uh, Kendra, the district's finance manager, get off and introduce uh, my consultants. Kendra? Yeah, so um, on April 6th, the board of directors awarded contract to Raftelis consultants to conduct the water and sewer rate study. Um, district staff has been working with Raftelis to provide the required data that will be used to conduct the rate study. Um, tonight, we have Melissa Elliott, Teresa Juristich, and Lindsay Roth, who are members of the Raftelis team to give a presentation about a rates 101 workshop that you know, explains the overall process of the rate study and um, provides, you know, a schedule, anticipated schedule, and then they'll open up to board comment and public comment as well. Um, so without further ado, we will, I think Melissa is going to start off the presentation and then we'll go from there. Yes, thank, thank you so much, Kendra. Um, uh, we'll go ahead and get our presentation pulled up here. I see that. Thank you, uh, Teresa. Um, so uh, we're really pleased to be here. We suggested to um, your staff there at the district that it might be nice to, since you have such an engaged board and engaged community, that we provide a presentation about what a rate study is and how it works and what our scope of work is um, as we work through this through the end of the year. Um, to get everybody kind of on a level playing field of, of knowledge here. And I understand there'll be a number of different uh, presentations uh, with your board coming up in the coming months to ensure that you get some uh, lots of input from the public as you progress through your rate study. So why don't we um, introduce our team um, on the next slide. Um, I'm Melissa Elliott. I'm an executive vice president at Raft Hellas, um, the our Western half of our, we're a national firm. Um, and the bulk of our work is in utility um, finances and doing rate studies. Um, very attuned to doing rate studies within California and have done them for a number of your neighbors uh, there. And I'm joined tonight by Teresa uh, Jertich, which is the, she's the project manager and will be doing the, uh, leading a lot of our technical work on the rate study. And Lindsay Roth is our lead consultant. She'll be our analyst on the project, um, working a lot behind the scenes. She's taking notes tonight. Um, helping us make sure we, we gather the input um, from this, this meeting. And the next slide, what we'd like to go over tonight is touch on just a bit about how utilities are funded because it is different than other types of local government. We wanna make sure you understand the steps of a utility rate study, especially how important cost of service analysis and the actual rate design are, um, what the rate approval process will look like for your study, and then touch on pricing objectives. When we price uh, water as a commodity, there's, there's a reason we do it the way we do it. So uh, rate structures are designed to actually create not just revenue for the district to, to operate, but also to achieve some uh, pricing objectives that go with that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Teresa. My, uh, uh, how we'll roll this is we'll go ahead and do the presentation. And then at the end, we will turn that back over um, to the board president and see if we have some questions from uh, your, your board of directors. Teresa? Um, thanks, Melissa. Uh, thanks everyone for having us here this evening. Uh, so for a utility enterprise, the majority of your revenue comes from your rates. You don't get, you know, much from any from any other sources. So it, it, it's the rate revenue that funds your enterprise. Um, and those rates are developed to recover the your annual costs, which include you know your your reserves and 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 debt service coverage targets. But they don't include anything like profits or dividends or anything like that. So this is a, a, a not-for-profit enterprise. Um, and California law proposition 218 requires that rates must be based on the cost to provide the services for the enterprise. 
So the rates and fees must fund your operations, they fund capital projects, they help maintain your reserves and ensure customer rate equity. And we do this through developing a financial plan, working through the cost of service analysis, and then designing the rates. So a rate study is a financial planning process that helps us set rates that consider um, fairness and equity, that align with your community values, are sufficient to um, fund the utilities uh, finances and make sure you stay financially viable and, and are able to provide your level of service to your customers. They're uh, sufficient to cover your operations and maintenance costs, enable critical infrastructure investment to aid in maintaining your appropriate levels of service and to comply with ever more stringent regulatory requirements and align with industry best practices and compliance with state law. So there are five main steps in conducting a rate study. First, we start with a rate setting framework like tonight's discussion, where we go over goals and policies, pricing objectives, you know, discuss all possible alternative rate structures. And then we move into our financial plan where we look out five to 10 years, uh, modeling what your annual um, o and and capital costs would be your reserve targets, um, look at, you know, ways to finance capital improvement projects and develop a couple of different scenarios for consideration. Once we have that financial plan developed, we move into doing the cost of service and rate design. So the cost of service is where we allocate those costs out. So we split between fixed and variable cost recovery. We split between particular customer classes, et cetera. So that's kind of the the meat of the rate development. And then we move into rate adoption where all the methodology is documented. Um, and we move into the rate adoption process with the notification, the Prop 218 notifications to customers and the public hearing. So in a nutshell, the financial plan looks at the revenues that you have coming into the enterprise, which um, are mostly your rate-based revenues. And those go towards paying your employee salaries and benefits, debt service and other costs, purchase water, if we're looking at a water utility, operations and maintenance, capital projects, and maintaining your reserves. And so we look at a status quo case and look at what is the funding gap? What would, what's coming in under your current existing revenue structure and rates um, versus what the projected needs are out in the future? And once we have um, developed a revenue, um, a revenue adjustments to to cover that funding gap, we then move on to the cost of service. Um, so basically the cost of service takes those revenue requirements that we've developed in the financial plan and says, how do we split those out? How do we split those between fixed charges and variable charges that you see on your bill? And do we wanna break those out and, assign, and allocate them to customers based on the different um, loads and characteristics um, that those customers place on your system. And we do this by following best practices and, indi and industry guidelines. Um, those come from the American Water Works Association for the water side and the Water, water Environment Federation on the wastewater side. So I mentioned fixed cost. Um, so when we do our cost of service, we can push costs into fixed and we can, or we can put them into variable. So costs that are often included in, in the fixed charge that you'll see on your water bill are things like customer service, billing and collection, processing and mailing bills, things related to your meter. So meter reading, meter shop, maintenance, repair, et cetera. And then we also can include system capacity because you need to size your system to meet your demands, regardless of whether, you know, how much flow is actually, let's say, going through a pipeline and, or you need to have that storage tank there um, so that you have the demand, you have the, the resource available when you have a peak demand. So we can move those costs and include those into fixed cost recovery. The other, um, the other part of the bill is the volumetric. So anything that's not in the fixed charge gets captured under the volumetric rate. And that can be in the form of a single uniform rate for every class, which is what the district currently has. You could look at uniform rates by customer class. You could have a mix of tiered rates for one class and uniform rates for another. So there's um, there's some very there's some options there on how you recover the volumetric charges. I do want to point out that if we do 
look at tiered rates that the cost to serve those customers in the tier, that's what the basis is for those tiers rate. It's not an arbitrary setting. There is, um, you know, there's calculations and math and justification for what costs are going into that tier and the, and the characteristics and the use um, that, that those tiers place on your system. Um, so when we look at tiered rates or even customer class rates, we'll often look at different components such as supply, delivery, or peaking because that's where we see the differentiation the differences between the customer classes and between different tiers. And then those tiers can be set um, um, on a different, on, on a variety of bases. It could be, you know, maybe your water supply cost or um, the peaking that we see on the system, et cetera. So there's, there's different methodologies available there. And then um, lastly, with that cost of service, between just looking at fixed and variable, you know, why would you potentially look at doing customer class rates? Well, these um, are recognizing that different types of customers generate different costs because of their use characteristics. Um, and each customer group must pay their fair share and can't be required to pay the cost incurred by another group. So for example, residential can't be required to pay more to, so that customer co commercial customers can pay less and vice versa. So now I'll just step through a couple um, rate structures for you. So the simplest one is the flat rate. So this is like your dollar per month based on your meter size. You pay the same thing every month. It doesn't matter how much you use. Super simple, super easy to understand, really great for revenue stability for the district, but it's not particularly equitable. It doesn't provide any sort of conservation signal and it's not really affordable for essential use customers. Um, so the next thing is to add in a uniform rate, so which is the structure that you guys currently have, the flat rate plus the uniform rate. And um, this continues, you've, you get re continuous revenue stability on this, depending on what your um, mix of, of, you know, the fixed versus variable portion of your bill. Um, still admin administratively easy to, um, to administer and pretty easy to understand. And it does provide a little bit of a conservation signal because as you use more water, your bill will go up. Whereas under the flat rate case, it doesn't matter how much water you, you use. Um, so it does have that benefit. It does have that little bit of a benefit. Um, another option that's out there is the seasonal rate. So that says during your off peak periods, you'll have a lower cost um, charge for the variable charge, but then during your peaking months, you would have a higher charge. You get a pricing signal going to your customers that say, you know, if you're going to be watering your lawn or your garden or whatever, it's going to cost you a little bit more to do that. Um, and you do get a little bit less revenue stability here because you have the variation and, you know, you don't know how much, um, you know, demand is going to vary or change um, between the off peak and the, and the peak months. And then the other is structure is an inclining tiered rate. Um, so in this one, you know, everybody steps through the first tier. Um, so if you use say five units of water on this on this graph, you would be paying a dollar for each of those units. But if you were using 15 units of water, your first 10 units would be priced at a dollar per unit, and those last those next five units of water would be priced at, you know, what if that's about $1.75 or so on this graph. So everyone steps through that first tier. And then as you use more water, you move into the next tier and the next tier. Um, so this one helps promote, promote conservation. Um, it's still fairly easy to understand, um, but it can potentially target large users who just, they're just a large entity. So they're just gonna, they're gonna be using a lot of water you know, or maybe they're a household with a lot of people in it, a multi-generational household or something like that. Um, so those are things to consider with the water rate structures. Um, and then pricing and objectives. There's several pricing objectives to consider when we do a rate study, and some of them kind of compete. For example, revenue stability. So if you have, you know, a higher fixed charge, you have more revenue stability, um, but it doesn't necessarily send as strong a conservation signal. So um, if you want, you know, 
revenue stability and conservation are both really high um, or strong pricing objectives, then we kind of really have to kind of be very artful in what gets put into fixed versus variable to try to, to try to balance those two out. And then there's other ones like defensibility and financial sustainability, which are pretty much givens. Like obviously it needs to be defensible. Um, and you also want to make sure that the rates are designed such that you can continue staying in operation and providing the level of service that your customers have come to expect. So we've had some um, you know, chats with the, with the district staff and folks and you know, what we've been kind of hearing and seeing is that, you know, revenue stability and affordability and conservation kind of are sort of bubbling to the top. Um, and that's one of the things we kind of want to hear from you guys today is kind of where, where you kind of fall out and, um, you know, your pricing objectives and, 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 and what's of, you know, importance to you. Um, Another piece of information to consider is uh, a, a survey of 325 um, California entities. We're looking just at the residential um, water rate schedules. The majority um, of residential water rates um, structures consist of a fixed charge plus a tiered rate. The next most common is the structure that you guys have, which is a fixed charge plus a uniform rate. And then there's a smattering of those other types. And then we wanted to kind of show an anticipated schedule. Um, dates aren't, aren't firmly locked in, but just kind of give you an idea of where, where we're going um, with this. Um, we'll, you know, as we move through getting the financial plans done, um, having a presentation, on those and getting input on, um, you know, which financial plan to move forward with. Uh, the district will be, you know, hosting a public outreach workshop. Um, we might, you know, be discussing you know, why, you know, what's what level of service is the district providing? You know, why, you know, do we need the revenue adjustments? Um, you know, discuss, uh, you know, rate alternatives, et cetera. Um, and then a rate authorization, uh, a meeting we look at and, and hopefully finalize the rates there. Um, and then, you know, the Prop 218 notice being mailed out with a, you know, public hearing um, scheduled for, you know, January, January with rates effective of, of February 1st. Um, and then as, you know, as, as part of that work, you know, we will be, um, you know, uh, developing as a, the financial plan, cost of service and rate study. We're gonna develop recommended water and wastewater rates for a five-year period covering fiscal year 2024 through fiscal year 2028. And our deliverables, oh, and we're gonna be um, developing two options for alternative water rate structures and our deliverables will be a final report um, documenting the rate study and then the rate model in Excel. So thank you for your, your time and listening to that. Yeah, with that, we'll uh, turn it back to um, your board president and, and see if there's any board discussion that uh, you'd like from us. Um, thank you, Melissa. Um, yes, there will be some board discussion. Uh, so we will begin that uh, this evening. Thanks. Um, I'd like to uh, hear from the uh, Budget Finance Committee, uh, since I believe that uh, you've had some discussions with uh, Reptelis already. Uh, oh, Gail? Yeah. Thank, but, thank you for that, Teresa. That, that was very helpful. Um, I, as we've discussed before, um, I think we all feel very strongly that outreach to our ratepayers is important. And in our discussions in the Budget and Finance Committee of how to conduct the rate study, we recognize that there might be a need for more than one public workshop, including a couple that would be run by staff and wouldn't necessarily involve Rack Pellis uh, being there directly. Um, we want to get feedback from the public on various approaches that we might take before things are set in concrete. But I think it's understandable that we're only going to get public response if they have something 
to respond to. In other words, we don't have a lot of members of the public here tonight because we're not actually talking about uh, the specifics. And I think that's understandable. So, so that our staff and uh, the board can start planning these outreach efforts, when do you estimate that we'll have some kind of information that we can begin to provide alternative scenarios? For example, fixed versus uh, volumetric charges, what the ratios would be, or what type of the tiered rates, um, what we might be considering regarding special rates for schools, mobile home parks, et cetera. And whether the, uh, to address the current huge capital expenditures due to the CCU fire and this last winter season storms, solely through increases in rates in the next five years versus spreading these costs out over a longer period of time by debt, or as Mr. Holloway suggested, potentially going after a, a bond. Um, I'm not talking about having exact numbers, but having some kind of indication or some information that we can present to the public. Can, can you kind of give us a feeling for that? Well, I mean, our, our we're looking at the like the August September time frame for having you know financial plans that would be you know ready to be you know disseminated to the 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 district board and and you know and the public. Well, obviously we have you know staff webinars in, you know in, during that time as we're developing that to go over inputs and assumptions and and to refine and to refine um, the process. We come up with some good. Um, financial plans for your consideration. Okay, so you're you're saying that those financial plans, which are largely going to control what kind of rates we might end up considering, will hopefully be completed about when? That the August August September timeframe. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Jeff. Uh, I think Gail covered most of what I was interested in. Um, I just want to make sure that we have sufficient uh, focus on the uh, capital requirements that we have and the, you know, the issues, special issues that are somewhat, you know, bound by time constraints related to the um, fire recovery and other disaster recovery that we have. Uh, we have uh, some limitations on how long our friends at FEMA will continue to pay for those things. They put deadlines on that. And so I want to make sure that we we look at uh, those not just as ordinary expenses, but some of them have rather specific deadlines that will be coming up. And so we need to make sure that that's factored into the analysis. Okay. Um, I didn't see a question there, so I don't know. No, I didn't have a question. I, okay. That was a, so that was a statement of, just a, of uh, okay. concern. Okay. Uh, Jamie? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things. So I just want to follow up on, on Gail's question. You were saying that you think a draft proposal with financials would be available in the August, September timeframe. Um, I noticed that you had an October public outreach workshop, um, which I'm assuming you were intending would be, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I was assuming that you were intending that would be the first time that we present uh, the outline of your, you know, the various proposals that you'll be putting forward to us to the public, or will we see those in August, September as a board before they are presented at that public outreach meeting? <laughs> Yes. Yes, for yeah. sure. And, and we, we, we have budget and see. finance will see those before yes. as, as well. And I, I, I would hope that there might be some back and forth of budget and finance on some of these well before we go to the public. So the, the idea would be that the first, that, that we would then sign off on, you know, a, several approaches that we would take to the public for consideration receive feedback from them on, and then at the, um, I guess I'm, I'm confused about what we're authorizing when we do the rate authorization. Um, is, it okay, is it okay if I jump in here? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so I want to be really clear. The first step is that financial plan. That's how much revenue you need to accomplish what you're going to accomplish. 
And that may be, um, once the board's seen that, that might be a really interesting way to get input or to at least explain to um, your customer base what it is that you're setting out to do and why you need that revenue. Um, so we need to have a, an okay on that financial plan before we then start going into cost of service, which as Teresa explained is an excellent, it, it, we, we take how much you need and then we decide and determine um, and analyze where that is gonna be coming from. What does it cost to serve certain parts of, of uh, your customer base, for example? And so that's kind of the second big step. Once we know those costs, we can then determine um, actual rate structures. So the, the knowledge of what rate structure we have and the exact, exact rate you're gonna charge is kind of the last part of that. And my understanding and talking to your staff is you do wanna bring um, your customers along with you on that journey as you're learning about that. And you wanna get input from them as you're moving along. So the one workshop that you did see on that screen is the workshop we uh, are under contract to be at as kind of a resource to you at that workshop. And that's why you saw that. If, if the district chooses to do additional um, input uh, sessions with, it, with its customers, um, you know, However, it works best for you all to get what you need to make your decisions as a board. Got it. Yeah, no, and I, I guess I don't, but what is the rate authorization decision that is on that was on your list of deliverables? Yes. Because that, we're not actually approving rates, or I mean, just, making a final decision until January, right? So that, that's is correct. The, the rate authorization is this board telling uh, staff this is the this is the this is what we want to put out on our proposition 218 to the public. We're we're informing customers this is what we are intending to do. And then the proposition 218 notices go out so everybody receives one of those. And then you have a public hearing and then you actually vote. So if that's the case, I think that that October date to even, I mean, if we want to do more public outreach, that may be too soon to be doing that rate authorization between the time that we get their proposals in September, you know, and have those workshops. Point taken, yeah. yeah. Yes. So and could I, I, don't, I don't believe that that schedule that they're putting in front of us is uh, cast in stone that those are the dates. I think the district can be flexible about this, if we see needs down the line, that says put a put a stop or put a hold on this, Melissa, is that something that? That's correct. It, it was an anticipated schedule. We were asked to to put one together of of what it would take to get you to a place where you uh, had rates um, implemented at a certain date. But it's certainly whatever you want to make it, you can make it. Okay. okay. Thank you. That. Um, I will reserve my uh, fu future comments for another meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I have a number of questions. Um, but before I go there, I want to want to say thanks for bringing up the issue about when you can get the share of mind of your community. Because after having been through a couple of these in the past for this district, not as a board member, but as a community member, you don't get the community share of mind until actually the Prop 218 notice goes out. And at that point in time, it's way too late. If you have a 45 day process that isn't going to be stopped, isn't gonna be tweaked if you get a lot of feedback from the community. Um, the only time I've seen that happen is in 2013 when there was a five year rate increase proposed the community went completely bananas and the board at the, at the meeting to approve the rates cut it back to three years. Um, and I mean, when I, when I say bananas, I mean bananas. It was, it was really bad because it was all around the Taj Mahal and, and uh, the community center combination and, and people were just nuts over that. We don't have that today. That's good Thank news. <laughs> but it really drove home the point for me that if you aren't doing these workshops after you have something specific to provide to the community, you're not going to get anything of any value and you're not going to get their share of mind. So let, let's not, but let's learn from those 
sort of more recent examples and not not do that again. Um, I, so, because that's what, I mean, the meetings, the 2017 meeting was also interesting too, Rick, you probably remember that. Um, there was, there, when people come out at these things, there's a lot of emotion that comes out to it as well. I mean, this isn't necessarily a journey in the sense that it's a pleasant thing that we typically use the word journey about. This is a process by which people, money are going to be extracted from their pocket. And so it's it's not always a pleasant experience when you get into these into these meetings. Um, I did have a couple of questions about structures and models and that sort of thing. Um, it doesn't look based on the the presentation. It doesn't appear that there's any focus on unbundling the rates relative to determining specifically where the money's going to go. So, for example, if you just have a big pot of money, there's no guarantee that any of it is necessarily going to go to any particular place. In both 2013 and 2017, the marketing material that was sent to the community said that these rate increases were needed for um, capital expenditures. There was really no mention about operating expenses. Two-thirds of the increased revenue from those two rate increases went to operating expenses not to capital. And really it wasn't until, I guess, the 2018, 2019 timeframe that there was any focus on getting capital going. And by that time, the increases in operating expenses had pretty much chewed up the anticipated 65% rate increase from that time um, because the expenses were skyrocketed just before the rate increase took effect. So uh, I, in order to kind of get around that situation, is there any way to be able to say, okay, out of the, this money that we're gonna charge, this amount of money is specifically for and cannot be used for anything other than capital expenditures? Um, Melissa? Uh, I was gonna actually ask if, your, uh, if Kendra would like to take that one first. I'm not sure how you would intend to handle that exactly. Um, so you're saying designate, it's kind of like the fire, not to use yeah. the fire recovery surcharge, but kind of like the fire recovery surcharge is designated for fire recovery efforts. You're saying like if we had a, a rate that was for capital expenses to designate it to like a capital expenditure fund, kind of like that? Yeah, I mean, if you have a, let's say a hundred dollar bill, which is kind of where we're at right now for our average bill, um, you know, let's say, I'm just picking a number out of my hat, this isn't the real number, uh, $30 goes specifically to capital, cannot be used in operating expenses at all, period. Um, one of the things I'm concerned about particularly over the last two rate increases, is that we've told the community we're going to do X and we've done mostly Y with the money. And in order to really be completely transparent and upfront with the community, in addition to needing that budget to match the term of the rate increase that's committed, that may be another way to do it. But if, if we don't want to do that, we could always say, yeah, X amount of money out of your bill, percentage-wise, fixed, I don't, whatever we come up with, goes specifically to capital or specifically to capital and maintenance. Because again, we still have all these steel tanks that, that aren't maintained and well past their maintenance life. Something other than just saying, here's a pot of money, trust us. So, so could I just follow on from that because um, for example, you did the rate study for Santa Cruz, and Santa Cruz actually does have mm -hmm. um, a part of its bill where it is specified that there's a certain fraction of it that is for capital um, expenditures. And uh, looking at, for example, Marin County, where I grew up, they also have something like that. They also have one for watershed maintenance because, they, like us, they have a huge forest that they have to deal with. So the question is, is do you know whether, you know, that, that's a way of, of communicating with the public where you think the Absolutely. money should go, which I think is a great idea. So I think what Bob's trying to get at is, do you know whether in those cases they also are tied 
to requirements or things that the board did that said, um, we actually have to spend the money this way. And, you know, maybe this isn't that you need, maybe you don't have to follow up on this. That's not your job. But if you happen to know, given that there are places that do make these kinds of splitting out of the bills, you know. I, I mean, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Let's, let's, let's. It is it is done. That is that is a that is a way that um, so folks do that, and they do that for exactly the reason you're talking about to make it very transparent. Um, some utilities will do that for a certain period of time. Maybe they have a specific project, and they actually name the fee so that it goes to that project, and you see it on your bill, and it's for transparency purposes. Um, it does set up um, on the staff side of things, the administration side of things. You want to be really careful with that, right? Because um, as you're as you're going through your regular audits and making sure that funding is going to the right place, there's there's just less flexibility with that type of thing. But that's that's possible. It would be a restricted fund. Um, we'd want to make sure you're you're you've got advice from your legal counsel on that and what you can and can't do with that. So staff is really clear um, on that um, and probably would be included in reporting as well. But that's a possibility. I mean, I think there's this notion out there that there are people in the community that don't want any rate increases at all. And I, I'm sure there's a, a handful of people like that. I think really what people are communicating is the level of trust that they have in the district to take a pot of money and actually use it in the way that it needs to be used is what's lacking. And, you know, unfortunately, over the last two rate increases, we haven't, as a community as a board as a as a district haven't done a great job of that um the the next thing i wanted to ask about was this the financial plan that you're putting together um it, is that financial plan um uh, or could that financial plan be the basis of a committed five-year budget uh for the district that would also again uh communicate to the to our um, community exactly where the money's going and why. Teresa, do you want to weigh in on that? Um, I mean, I mean, ideally, that's the the two work together, right? That, you know, we're working from the initial budget, and we're doing our best along with the district staff to estimate what we think those costs will be over the next five years or so. Um, you know, and then, you know, then, then it's kind of on the district side to, you know, say, you know, how, how, you know, is there, you know, kind of a, you know, a plan to bring budgets in similar to what was in the financial, what gets developed through the financial plan and rate study process you know, or where does, you know, does something have to change because circumstances change from what was, you know, presumed in the model. Um, I mean, I've had other, you know, one other community like really sort of focus, focus on that and say, we need to drive our budgeting process to, you know, be more in line with the financial plan because we went through the process to do that. But yeah, I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what I, I actually don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> well, that, that, that's fine. I mean, it, it at least provides a basis for things. I mean, in the last five-year rate increase, the operating expenses were um, projected to grow, I think, under four percent. They actually came in closer to five and a half to six percent. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when you deal with compounding over a long period of time, it's actually a fair amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's something else I'm trying to to get at. Um, one more question, excuse me, before I, I yield the floor, um, has to do with um, uh, estimating uh, costs. So um, in the 2017 time period, uh, we had a uh, more or less a, a fixed cost of, or a fixed increase for staffing costs, which is a majority of the operating expenses that was, was, was pretty much the same year to year. Um, where this board appears to be going with respect to new contract is, could potentially fluctuate quite a bit 
uh, every year, depending on the uh, inflation rate uh, underlying, you know, CPI. And, you know, depending on where you think that's going to go, it's anywhere from two to 10%, probably, unless we get into a serious inflationary mode. But what have you seen um, districts do uh, from a rate point of view to be able to um, adjust to that? Because at the end of the day, you still need to have X amount of margin that is revenue less expenses, uh, operating expenses or non-operating expenses in order to apply that money to the capital expenditures, whether you're doing that through um, uh, cash, current cash or a, a debt like a loan setting aside what Mr. Holloway was talking about with respect to a bond, which I, I think is worthy of a discussion, but not part of my question. Let, let me start and I'll ask Teresa if she has anything to add. I, I think a lot of your questions are if we had better crystal balls, um, this, would, this would be much easier. And it is, it is difficult for staff to kind of look out five years and imagine what's going to happen with their staffing. Imagine what type of things might happen in the district. You've had a number of terrible weather events that have, um, that have impacted you and impacted operations. Um, and so that, that's just a challenge. And so we do rely on staff to give us their best estimate based upon kind of what they've seen in the past, but then also looking forward. So, sorry, um, that, that, sorry that, that's, that's actually not what I'm asking. I recognize mm -hmm. that you cannot forecast with any accuracy around particularly inflation. That's a macroeconomic mm -hmm. uh, thing that we have no control over. What I'm asking is whether or not there are any examples of districts that have come up with rate structures to explicitly address that in order so that on a year-to-year -year basis, they aren't losing margin necessary to be able to continue their capital uh, improvement program. You know, that specifically is not something I have seen. Teresa, have you seen that? Um, I'm not sure if I've seen in California where there's kind of a a minimum like cost of living adjustment that's built in. I might need to canvas our folks to see if they've seen that and what the what the particular language read. Great, uh, thank you. I do have some other questions, but I want to let other okay. folks go. Thanks. Um, you talked on one of the slides about the uh, examples of pricing objectives. Um, and we saw I don't know, eight different ones there. One that I didn't see uh, starred was financial stability. Uh, did that uh, come up in your discussions with either the staff or budget and finance committee uh, or did you only have three stars to be able to put on there because you can't pick everything that was on that chart? No, no, so, oh. Sustainability. Sustainability, I think is the one that you were. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. okay. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, had, I had mentioned that like defensibility and financial sustainability are two sort of givens, right? We have to make sure that the rates are defensible and we need to make sure that we've developed something that allows you to continue doing your business and providing the level of service that your customers have come to expect. So those ones are just automatic givens. So the stars were like, what did we hear? What have we been hearing that says that what do we need to think about in addition to those two? Oh, okay. I didn't know that that was a given. Me too. Course. That made me feel better to hear that. Yes, that's not the impression that I, <laughs> no, I, 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 I got. I mean, guys, that to be fair, they actually didn't mention it. Okay, yeah. sorry. Okay. I just did. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, the different rate structures. And uh, can you bring to us some different, uh, take, you know, three different customers, give us some examples of tiered billing structure for that individual across a, either a three or six month period. Um, and the same under our current structure so that for the uh, a more basic uh, presentation, we could see how that might change 
not in the uh, the bigger picture that you were presenting to us on, but on my bill, how is that gonna? Yeah. You're, you're talking about billing, what we call bill impacts. And so when we develop the rate structure alternatives, that's exactly what we'll do. We'll show how yeah. that impacts specific customers with their actual bill right. um, and, the, and how that works throughout the year. And we would also show for different amounts of water usage. Okay. So people can kind of identify what that would, might mean to their household budget. Right. So that... Not only the rest of the rate payers, but the board can also see how does that influence. Okay. Um, do you do any amount of comparative aspects uh, to other districts, other areas, um, as part of what you're bringing back to us? Yes. That's part of our, our scope of work is to do a, a comparison to other, other districts. In fact, a couple of your neighbors have had us do their rate studies, and you all were one of the comparative districts. Okay. All right. We'll how did we, no. <laughs> uh, and um, how far out do you go, or what kind of uh, bounds do you put on that? Uh, because I'm thinking that uh, although we might not be uh, comparative from a district size to some of the larger ones, in the Silicon Valley area, we're competing with them for staff. And does that influence then rates? What kind of districts do you go out to compare? I guess is the we generally will ask your staff what they see as their peer utilities in the area. Um, most utilities will choose those that are close by that their that their customers might be aware of, you know, most folks do not select where they're going to live or place a business based upon water rates. I won't, I won't say all people, but that's usually unusual. Right. And, um, so, so that's typically how we do it. So we would just ask your, ask your staff if there's something, you know, the, the board is interested in specifically, um, we would just let your staff know and, and we can do that. Hey, Mark, okay. it's, it's round up the usual suspects. <laughs> but it doesn't have to. I know it doesn't okay. have to be, but that's normally what happens, right? Okay. All right. Uh, those are the questions that I have. Uh, I. Could, Where do you want the public county to establish parameters? Sure. Well, I, I actually have another question. I think uh, Bob did too. And just a couple more, answer. just a couple more, and then oh, we can go out. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, then let's go back around the table again. Yeah. Gail? Um, I, I'd just like to get some more information on tiered rates. Um, and your slide sort of depicted the customer class as being quite distinct. For example, residential versus small businesses versus industrial. But um, I think I know that tiered rates are used in other districts that are much more like us, where most of the customers are residential. And so how do you cost out the various tiers in that circumstance? And, you know, I mean, just from uh, first principles, you could say, well, there's different among residential, maybe some are at different elevations. And so, you know, that costs a different amount to provide, or maybe some get their water from wells and that costs us more money to deliver because we have to pump it out of the ground. I, I, I kind of suspect that at least my feeling is, is there's not gonna be a lot of enthusiasm for that kind of picking on individuals. I think we're all kind of like D'Artagnan and you know, three musketeers, you know, one for all, all for one kind of thing. And we're all together on, on this. And so um, I, I, so, but on the other hand, I can see that when you're looking at the, the incremental cost of that last bit of water, when you have a large consumer, that person is imposing costs on the whole district by requiring that we have more uh, capacity, more storage, and also usually ends up meaning that we have to pump more groundwater um, especially in the summer, to supply that demand, which uh, is more expensive because of the power and also runs us afoul eventually with uh, groundwater rules and our requirements for meeting uh, Santa Margarita um, sort of guidelines, which could potentially put us in a situation where we have to undertake expensive projects to raise groundwater levels. So it's not so much that the water actually costs more to, big it, to take it to those big users, but that they're 
um, effect on the incremental of that last little bit of water is significant. So how do you cost that out? Well, you've done a great job of explaining a lot of that. So um, well done. Um, part of it is the demand analysis, right? So, so what you just said is and it, demand analysis and also your uh, pricing objectives. So if for the district, conservation is vitally important and you're really trying to drive usage down, you might have a different tier heights than a district that is less concerned with that. Um, and so when we look at demand, what we typically find in districts is there's some natural breaks in usage patterns among residential users. And that's where we start. And then we start thinking about, well, what do we want to accomplish with the rate structure? And we want to make sure that we kind of refine that based upon that. Teresa, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, and that's that's where, you know, like the peaking factors, we start looking at peaking factors by class and by tier if we're doing tiers for say residential. And so that helps us allocate costs. We have al we allocate costs to peaking, they get allocated to supply base. There's a couple different categories they get allocated to. And then we can subdivide those costs to the different tiers and customer classes based on how much peaking demand they put on the system. So we we can dive down into these um, you know, different buckets, if you will, of cost, and then allocate them based on, you know, user characteristics. Thank you. That, that was all I had. Okay. Uh, okay. Just okay. So, um, going back to a subject that we talked about earlier a bit on uh, the outreach to customer groups and when we go out and talk to them about what we're doing, um, it occurs to me that. First of all, we should identify a number of specific subgroups of customers within our uh, communities and hold special uh, outreach sessions for those particular subgroups rather than just hold a, a series of, uh, of wide open public meetings at the library type of thing. For example, the school. Exactly, we would wanna to talk to the schools, uh, bring in the mobile home parks for one. Uh, so basically segment our customer base somewhat and also use that as a means of communicating messages that are specific to those groups. Um, in order to facilitate this, I would like to suggest, I don't think this needs to be a motion, but I would like to suggest that the budget and finance committee work with staff and maybe with our public relations agency to break up uh, or you know, to come up with a schedule of groups and and start the process of uh, organizing a series of uh, meetings. Can I suggest maybe that that would go to the committee that's actually specifically formed to communicate with? Well, that's fine. Right. Yes. So maybe we do the message and they do the, the or however. Yeah. We should work together. But but there's an admin committee whose yes, I know. function is that outreach. I'm, I'm yeah. On the committee. So. Okay. So that was my my thought there. All right. Uh, Jamie, anything else? Um, well, I mean, I would just add to that that I agree it's the admin committee and in the contract that we um, have with Miller Maxfield, we included um, funding for a potential workshop with the understanding that we would probably need some support with this kind of thing when we got to, you know, doing public outreach around the, the rate study. So. Um, what I would ask staff to do is bring in Miller Maxfield at some point when appropriate to help support the planning of these workshops and outreach activities um, and, you know, get them involved in organizing these, you know, customer segmented meetings. As an example, they can do those phone calls to try and get people into those meetings. They can find facilities, places to have them if we need to, you know, find some places in the community to have these meetings. Um, and they can do the outreach, you know, they can publicize them as necessary as well. One or two workshops are probably possible. You're looking to have staff go out to 20 groups, different groups. I didn't hear 20. Rick. Well, we have a lot of different groups. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't hear 20. Parks. That staff is not going to have that kind of time to spend going out. I mean, I think that we should coordinate. Let some of these people come to us and have workshops. We're not going to be able to have multiple workshops for all these groups. Just no. staff doesn't have that time. No, but we can prioritize some that might be we most can, important. We can have a, 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 I would say, a couple, yes, but not 
so all these different groups. I mean, the board can direct, but I can tell you right now, it's not. Why don't Why don't we let the admin committee yes. discuss that in the subsequent uh, committee meeting with you and see if you can come up with okay, here's the X number that we could reasonably target, um, and that it's a large enough group that you're not going to spend staff resources to go out and talk to two people and end up talking to two people yeah. out there. If that's the case, we should be we should be here. Mark. Okay. So could we agendize really this for the August? Should hear that, not staff. Those people should come to board meetings, <sighs> board committee meetings, and not come to staff because you're the ones that are going to make the decisions on how to raise rates, not staff. We can recommend. I, I think board members right should, board support. members should be in attendance yeah, too. Board members should be in attendance yeah. or should participate. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's a great idea. Great idea to agendize. Let's do that. So yeah. for the for the, for the admin committee meeting in August. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. You must have been in marketing. You do market segmentation. Yes, I do. <laughs> um, okay. Um, another question, Paul? I have uh, several. Um, uh, actually, questions and comments. On the conservation side, um, I, I'm mindful that we're about 20% under the state goal for indoor water usage. Um, I, it, Indoor water usage, not not total water usage, indoor water usage, I doubt that it varies substantially in the summertime. My point though is that I am deeply concerned about continuing to beat on the customers regarding conservation. Doesn't mean I want um, us to lose ground in where we are, but I think we can pretty much say, uh, we got a status quo here on continuing to beat people over the head, unless we're gonna start providing specific targets, which we've never done. Um, and this also gets into a question about, well, where are we with the drought declaration and, and that sort of thing? Because the, the the drought declaration process we went through the, the last time wasn't completely transparent to the community. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical of comparisons to other districts simply because there's a ratcheting effect that goes on when you do that. Um, and I think ultimately, if we can bring some people in that that are really like us, maybe not necessarily the usual suspects, maybe that will give us some better information. Otherwise, I, I think we kind of know what, what that is all about. For me, it's not so much financial sustainability, it's district sustainability. Um, and the financial part of it is the way that the district achieves sustainability. As a district, we are not sustainable at this point in time. We are not sustainable on maintenance. We're not sustainable on capital. Our current operating margin is about 3 million. Uh, we need somewhere between five and six if we are really gonna be doing and executing on the capital improvement program. So if we're going to be really upfront about sustainability, we need to do that. With respect to that, the conversation we had at the last board, maybe not the last board meeting, the one before about reserves, the basis for the calculation on the reserves for capital was based on a $75 million number, I think it was. If you read the policy, it's not what's in the um, plan for the next few years, it's the total capital cost. And I, I have asked for an agenda item on this if we need to discuss that further to make sure that we're all on the same page. Because using a $75 million number, um, when they start doing the analysis is gonna give a completely skewed view of what our actual capital requirements are. So I, I, if we need to have an agenda item on that, I would like to request that we do so. Um, and I, I think you, you saw that. Yes. Um, last question um, on your model. I believe one of the things that was in your proposal was the fact that you all have a, uh, I think it's a really slick model for doing um, uh, these financial plans. And that ultimately, I think one of the outcomes of this is that that model would be available to Kendra and the finance team for their use to help in budgeting so we can make that process faster, better, provide more analytics, metrics, that sort of thing about what our plans are. Um, is, that a, is that accessibility? only for this period of time that you're doing the study? Or is that a long-term forever, we, we get access to it whenever we want? 
It's, it's yours. We'll deliver it to you. It's Excel based. Um, there's a little bit of training that we can do with uh, Kendra and her team, and uh, it's all yours. You own it. Excellent. Um, and then, sorry, the, one more thing on the bond. I do think we need to have a conversation about that at some point during this process. Um, we are undergoing a very dramatic demographic trans transition in our valley, um, and the people that are buying their houses now um, are not buying them at you know a quarter million dollars or two hundred thousand, three hundred like like we did when when we bought in thirty years ago. So the the the, the upside there, um, if if that's a path we want to go down in conjunction with this, um, might be something to 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 take a look at, particularly if we get really transparent and uh, firm in our operating budgets uh, that we can present to the community. Um, Melissa, is bonding something that? could cover further for us at another meeting. Um, I'm going to pass that to Teresa and see. I, I don't think that's... I, I, I mean, in our, in our rate models, if, you know, we kind of look at... We look at kind of where the revenue adjustments are, seeing without doing any sort of bonds or SRF loans or whatever, and then if we're seeing something that, you know, it looks like there's, you know maybe issuing a bond or something, you know, we'll put, we'll put that, we'll put that in, but it's kind of, you know, we're, we're not acting as your financial advisors, right. um, but we put okay. in, we can, we, we certainly can build that into the model and yeah, kind of have a placeholder in presumed, you know, um, terms okay. and conditions yeah. for that. And that, and then that becomes part of like the financial plan, but, you know, and, you know, but, you know, as time gets closer to that, then you would, you know, work okay. with your financial advisor to, I think that's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we don't recommend specifics, but we can test it for you and you can kind of get a sense of what it does. No, oh, that's yeah. right. We want, we want to get the recommendations from our banker. Or our yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I think the board is done with questions. Rick, you wanted no, to want establish, uh, uh, um, interject before I go out to the public? Right, just establish time limits and oh. how many times. Right. Okay. Can, can I ask a favor, though? Go ahead. This is a very meaty conversation. I would like to see us not just cut folks off if they have, if they're making good points and it's really on point, they're not repeating themselves. I'd like to see us get as much input in this as possible at every meeting we have on rates. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Rick? It's your call. Okay. Um, I would uh, like to hear from the public. I would like to keep it at uh, three minutes, um, as we have in the policy. Uh, if there is substantial uh, discussion or substantial input from a public member uh, that the board feels necessary to follow up on with discussion, we can certainly ask ask questions come back at that point. Yeah. So uh, with that, I'd like to open it up to the public to see what comments we have. Right. And, uh, excuse me, Mr. Holloway, um, do we have the timer up on screen? Yes, Mr. We, Holloway was we will have the timer asking up. about before. I can, I can just put my laptop up. Like and, screen. I, I have spoken to Eric about the okay. timer and he should and have I think that. To his, Eric? I think I'm correct, Mr. You were looking for it to know, well, how much time? Does it I shouldn't need the time you on my phone to say, hey. It's better if the person can see what's going on. Yes, I, I can hear. Yeah. And, yeah. and not just to cut off at some point. Yes. Um, right. I, um, I was aware that Rack Tellis did the City of Santa Cruz uh, Water Department rate study a couple of years ago. So I took a look at that and um, uh, it looks pretty good to me, actually. Um, it, it ha Santa Cruz has these uh, elevation charges. We've never done that here. In fact, um, I've been a customer for more than 40 years, 
and this district, uh, to my recollection, has never treated uh, one neighborhood different than another neighborhood. Uh, there was never anything that said if you uh, if you get your water from wells, we're going to charge you a different rate than if you get your water from streams. Or if your house is uh, full disclosure, my house is about 500 feet of elevation higher than where we are right now. Uh, so this kind of sticks in my craw a little bit, the idea that we might do an elevation surcharge like the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, but when I looked at their rate study, all of the elevation charges were less than $1. Um, it looked like the top one was going to go over a dollar by the end of the five years. But they, they were all, currently, they're all less than $1. If somebody's less than $1, I'd say forget about it, if that's all it is. Um, because I think it, it really sticks in my craw that uh, there's a lot of history here. And if you're going to single out, I, I mean, when, when I hear uh, the idea that you might charge more for somebody at a certain elevation, I start thinking about wells and how deep are the wells? Because I think all of our wells are probably deeper than 500 feet. And so anybody that's getting their water from wells is also, the water is being elevated to get up to ground level. Um, I couldn't, one of the things about the city of Santa Cruz is they don't get any property taxes, but we do. And I couldn't tell from the discussion that the consultant is aware that we do get property tax. And that means, to me, that means that we don't need as much fixed revenue from water rates as Santa Cruz does, because we already have some fixed revenue from, uh, from property taxes. Another thing is, uh, I looked at the request for proposals, and it says that uh, you want to get uh, you want the consultant to do some something to you, you want them to study the low income program. And my understanding of a low income program is that it is completely funded by the property taxes that we get because that's not cost based. We, we've got some discretionary income that we can apply to a, a, a good purpose uh, without having to justify it based on cost. So it's important that the consultant is aware of uh, how much property taxes we pay. Um, I'm out of time, but I have more to say. Okay, this is Thank exactly, you, Holloway. It's exactly why I asked. Um, anybody else from the public? Hello, I'm Jim Mosier, I live in Felton. I've uh, <clears throat> been a repair for a couple of decades. And um, I've been very encouraged by the discussion tonight. Uh, a lot of my comments are just reaffirming much of what's already been said. <clears throat> I really I think we should be moving to tiered rates. I absolutely agree with Director Maywood and Mr. Holloway that I, we should be treating neighborhoods the same. I think the tiered rates should be based on use where heavy users uh, pay more per gallon. I think it's completely justified. Those were the kinds of breaks we had here and in most of California until there was a public court decision, uh, I believe it was in 2016 and 2017, <clears throat> that basically threw them all out. And I was very encouraged that uh, Rev Tellus is aware of uh, the kinds of strategies to be used to be in compliance with that appellate case. Um, and many uh, districts, including Santa Cruz and many around us, now have those tiered rates based on uh, volume. Of use. <clears throat> and I agree, we really need to take a look at the schools as special use. Um, and I'm glad that the board is, uh, appears to be uh, ready to look at those, um, those factors. <clears throat> I think uh, for me, a second thing that's very, very important is uh, that we address uh, the needs of low income and fixed income taxpayers to the extent we can. Um, the low income rate assistance program is one strategy. Uh, I had seen when I examined Raf Pellis's uh, presentations, or the, the, I guess it was the staff presentations in Santa Cruz, that they had stated that Raf Tellis was also assisting uh, them in, um, in looking at how to help those folks uh, who are low income or in fixed income, because um, we want to treat out, uh, water as a fundamental human right. Most importantly for me, and I won't have time to say everything I was hoping to say, 
but it's for ratepayer engagement. I just think this is absolutely critical. I totally agree with uh, Director Folks on this. Um, we, we need to uh, get options out to folks so they understand what the board is looking at so you can have input. You need to have buy-in. Um, and that wasn't done the last time. Uh, and I think it was a big mistake and it created a lot of uh, distrust in the, in the community. So um, I'm hoping that uh, uh, the board and staff can do what they can for this. And, uh, and I certainly would like to be involved in any way I can to help. Um, and finally, uh, since my time's almost up, I'll just say that with this issue of operating budget versus capital budget, I would hope that when we uh, talk about this, that we realize that these two um, these two uh, buckets actually interact substantially. I actually learned this uh, thinking about the engineering department and the environmental department, knowing that they spend an substantial amount of time on capital projects and reconstruction projects, <clears throat> yet that's all treated as operating. Um, yet it's going to capital. When you have a bunch of capital projects, you're going to raise you. operating and it's not going to show up. Thank uh, you for your months. comments, Mr. Mitchell. I also have more to say. I really think we need to revisit this. I would encourage I would encourage members of the public that have significant additional to say or you want to express, please send something in writing to us with your thoughts in it. I look at all of the public comments that we get um, at future at future meetings. It's on the agenda. We'll see it then and if board members see that there's you know, points there that we want to, we'll delve into that. So, Mark, this uh, is exactly the transparency issue yes. here. We really need to move away from that. People speaking in public actually generates more interest on the part of the community rather than just putting it in writing where they may or may not see it if it's buried in the agenda yep. somewhere. We keep relying on the notion that, well, if we just put it in the agenda, they'll see it. Right. We need to let the community speak on this and speak right. as long as they're making Thank good you. points. Thank you, Bob. I'm looking at the at the procedures that we've set forth. The procedure that's, allows you to make exceptions on your discretion. And, and that's what I'd like to follow this evening. So I'd like to continue the meeting. I, I want to make it really clear that he has the discretion to, to make those changes. Right. You are not doing so. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, additional comments? Yes. Thank okay. you. Uh, three parts. First of all, uh, the up and down vote on Prop, Prop 18 for, for this issue with, of the rate increase. I, I didn't hear any specific date when that might happen. Could we Could we have a date? I mean, is there a date and it just wasn't mentioned? or It was December 1st when it would go out. I'm concerned that that voting would then be between the holiday period, and that's just a concern of mine. But I'll I'll leave it at that. The second thing, benchmark. I believe strongly in benchmark, and I think it's been a lot of discussion about that. I'm just not sure we're we're concentrating on the right end. You know, we're we're talking a lot about the type of rates, tiered, you know, whatever. And I think I would like to see data if if they have it from other districts. Uh, comparing our how, how what we do with the money, in other words, operating expense breakdown, capital outlay breakdown, uh, outside consultant breakdown. In other words, how do we how do we compare to other districts on how we're spending our money? I think that's where you're, you're going to either win or lose the ratepayers is how you're spending your money, not how you how you decide to, to collect. It. And the last comment is just on. Has anybody on the board thought about the fact that we are in the process of hiring a new district manager and they're going to be saddled with this five-year rate increase after they come on board? I mean, is that is that a concern? I'm not saying it is a concern. I'm just saying, is should that be something that should be discussed and, and, and at least ad addressed? Because, you know, I, I, for one, always hated having to come into a position where it, it was a fait complete. You know, you've got to do this and your budget for the next three years. Okay. I yield the rest of the time. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear from anybody else uh, participating remotely. See if there's any comments there. 
Do you see who uh, the attendees are? It's, it's yes, still. I can see. Okay, thank you. I see no other comments. Um, Mark, Mr. I'm, I'm sorry, Forty Word. When you say you want a written comment, would you like us to take our comments and write them down and send them to you? Uh, not necessarily what you've said this evening. If, if there's more that you want to expand on, please. Yes. Uh, Rick? The staff has no questions. Um, you want to continue with public comment? OK. And you do have a, a so. CDM, so uh, okay. raise your hand. Yeah. OK. Uh, is she unmuted? It appears so. OK. Cynthia? I can't hear her, so. Here we go. Awesome. Keep going. <laughs> I, I just um, said that I would like to hear more from Jim Mosher and Bruce Holloway because I think they're making Excellent comments, and uh, we should hear from each of them again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I'd like to come back to the board um, as individuals and see if, if the board has any comments or thoughts based on what we've heard from the public here, uh, based on specifics that they may have thrown out. Uh, Gail, no. anything? Bob? Um, yeah, I'll let them have my time for speaking okay. because I think they're making great points and I'd like to hear more of them. Okay. Good. I would only make one comment and that is that when you look at a study design or a list of things that we're looking at, uh, you should not necessarily assume that that means that we're going to do that. It means that it's something that we're looking at and going to compare with other potential strategies also. So um, the fact that we may ask for some information on something does not necessarily mean that's the plan. Okay. I, I was just going to say <clears throat> in response to the, the comment about the, you know, recruitment for the general manager. I mean, there's a lot of things to think about as we go through the recruitment of the general manager, but I will say having worked in public agencies that do public rate increases for 20 years, an incoming general manager will be so happy that they don't have to deal with this process because it's behind them. So and the board sets the policy. Right? Oh. So the district manager Okay. All right. Um, Good point. Then, uh, then I would like to hear further from uh, Mr. Holloway and Mr. Mosher. So. Uh, Bruce? All right, thank you very much. Um, just a suggestion for Rack Tellis. You had a slide about um, seasonal rates, and there was a bullet point that said revenue instability. But one of the things that I, what, what I would say is that we have seasonal usage patterns, and that means that there's revenue instability to begin with. And then the trouble with seasonal rates is that it exacerbates the revenue instability. So that's what I would say is the problem. It's not that it's, it's exacerbating revenue instability. So it never seemed to me that seasonal rates would work very well. Um, one thing that the consultant uh, said a number of times, that we're talking about sizing the system based on demand. And maybe that's true in San Jose or someplace like that. But my observation here, like in my neighborhood, I think the system is sized based on um, fighting a fire, based on fire protection. Um, I'm one of the lucky people that has a six inch water main on my street, but we only have maybe 20 houses. So I'm, I don't, I'm not really a water professional, but in terms of delivering water to houses so people can wash their clothes and make dinner and take a shower and so on, it might be that a two inch water main would work on my street. And the only reason we have a six inch water main is to fight a fire. Same thing with the tank at the top of the hill. Um, 
there's a standard which Rick knows very well. Uh, you need, I don't really know what it is exactly, but it's more than 200,000 gallons for, uh, to fight a structure fire. And so I'm pretty sure that the tank at the top of my hill is bigger than that. Um, and we have 47 tanks and most of them are probably sized to fight a fire. So the way I think of it is that many parts of the system are sized, not based on uh, demand at all, but based on uh, fire protection. Um, now, the, the, uh, since I looked at the Santa Cruz rate study, it looked, it looked like a typical uh, residential customer might get a bill with five line items. Um, one of them is called infrastructure recovery, one's called rate stabilization, and a whole bunch of different things. Um, I found that kind of confusing. I, I don't, I really, if I got a bill, I pretty much want to know the mechanics of how it's calculated. Uh, to have all these different line items, you know, there ought to be a way to get that information somehow. I don't know if it really needs to be on every single bill. And uh, using the uh, example that Director May had uh, of, of a watershed management fee, if I saw a watershed management fee on my water bill, I'd be thinking, where did this come from? Is this from Cal Fire? Is this some new mandate by the state? Why is this broken out separately? What does that mean? Please, please um, finish. Go ahead. That's okay. okay. I, uh, I think I've said most of it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Jim Bozier again from Felton. Uh, just very briefly, um, I, I wanted to say that um, in talking about the operating capital budgets, just how uh, I think it's important that if we're going to use those buckets, that there be some estimate of how capital improvements, uh, repair, uh, and uh, replacing uh, broken things and responding to these uh, disasters, what impact they have on the operating budget, because otherwise it's going to be um, uh, it's going to be confusing. Uh, in terms of comparative rates, I agree. I can't remember. I think uh, Director Folk said this. I think it would be good to, to be comparing with uh, other districts that are more like us than, say, Santa Cruz or Scotts Valley, where they're compact um, and uh, they don't have they don't deal with the watershed issues that we have or the extensive pumping we have to do because the housing infrastructure is so scattered. Um, and uh, I also just I wanted to say that it is, I think, really important when we go out to the public that you give them an opportunity to respond to what you're considering. What are the options you're considering so that the people know what to respond to specifically? Uh, and I saw that they were, uh, I, I watched a lot of the video that was done in Marin County when they were doing a rate study and they did exactly that. And I thought it was very effective uh, because it brings people in and makes them feel like they're part of the discussion, number one. But number two, you can hear what people are having to say so that you can respond uh, in your decision-making to try to meet what some of the, what the community is at its best trying to communicate to you. Um, and again, I would like to be involved in trying to help that communication happen. I just think it's really, really critical. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we don't have a motion or anything else. I, I do have a couple of uh, follow-ups, if we may. Okay. Um, Looking at the low income rate assistance program, so currently coming out of the lease, um, the cellular lease revenue, um, it could come out of the property tax, but pretty much 100% of the property tax money is being used to help um, fund our loan repayments um, and for capital. So let's keep in mind that if we were to, I mean, if it, you know, the bucket is so big, if you take money away for this purpose, you have to put it back or say you're not going to do as much capital uh, improvement if the rest of your mar operating margin remains fixed. Um, so let, let's be mindful of that ultimately, the state really needs to fund this at scale. We, we are not at the scale of a Scotts Valley and we don't have the wealth of, excuse me, a scale of a Santa Cruz. We don't have the wealth of Scotts Valley. Um, th this needs to be funded by the state. Um, and uh, we need to be working towards that aspect of it in order to get that fully funded. 
um, the the other part of that on the property taxes, Bruce, I think you're saying we don't need as much fixed revenue. I, I, I'm not sure I would go that far because of the fact that we do have a fairly large amount of capital that has not yet been addressed um, relative to what we need to be spending every year on a capital base that's somewhere around $450 million. Um, and if you just take all the components of that, divide by their life and add up the number, um, it comes out to somewhere around five to six million. So I, I, I guess I would be concerned if we were to say the property tax money can be used in lots of different ways rather than what we're trying to use it for right now, which is capital improvement. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'd also like to follow up um, on a comment from uh, Jim Mosier on the comparative to other districts. Um, and to kind of Bob's point of, well, it's the usual suspects, you know, going to Scotts Valley, going to Santa Cruz, you know, our, our immediate neighbors. Um, is there a way to look at other districts that are in a mountainous area, spatially uh, spread out with driving six miles to get to eight customers in some cases. But they would also have to be the most expensive community to buy a house in in the state of California, yes. which is where we live. Yeah. And they would have to have the unique aspect mm -hmm. of the fact that we have probably higher incomes for our mountainous rural community than most other similar mountainous rural communities do because yeah. of the nature of the people who live here and work over the hill in the Bay Area, as yeah. opposed to if I'm living in, you know, Jackson or Placerville, and my job market is more limited to you know the the opportunities yes. there. So so that's my concern about this yeah. comparative issue is that it's not just about the water operations comparison; it's also about the community costs to live in that community and work in that community. So that's to the point that I was asking about the uh, comparison of competing salary wise or competing with staffing wise with somebody from one of these other larger districts. Can, can, I, can, Santa, I, offer, can I offer? Santa, Santa Clara Valley, let me finish Bob, Santa Clara Valley. It, and I don't know how to get to, get to that. Uh, so yes, I'm struggling. Let's ask struggling the with tell us well, 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 but, Yeah, but before we go there, I wanna throw one more thing yeah. in, which is, I want to be very cautious about doing that. If you look at the, the, the census information in our area, there is still an enormous percentage of our community that lives on well under the median household income. This is, this is a community that is not composed of all the folks driving over the hill or working over the hill by any means. And so to, to and unfortunately, our, one of our previous general managers tried to use the average income as the justification for why rates should skyrocket the way they did. And he got raked because of the fact that this community is not composed just of people making 100 to 150,000 a year. I think that's that's fair. Fair. It but, is very, but the, the, the people who live in this community currently live in this community at yeah. the cost that this community has. They may be struggling. I'm not saying that there are not people who are struggling. But my point is, if you go to Jackson or Placerville or Camino, there are people struggling there too, right? And there are people who are making more money there too. We need to look at comparisons that both look at what are, you know, what are similar operating conditions, because I think it's a really valid point. The city of Santa Cruz does not have the same operating conditions that we do, but we need to be careful that they have the same cost of living conditions that we are experiencing in this community, whether you are the poorest person or the wealthiest person living in this community. Right, and I think the cost of living affects the- Everybody. Well, it affects everybody, but how does it affect our costs? It affects staffing and what we need to do staffing-wise to be able to hire. So. Uh, uh, Melissa, thoughts on how to uh, 
This is hard, as you're noticing, because yeah. utilities are really unique, and and the all of the different um, uh, pieces of this that you talked about make them very unique. This is this is why we sometimes, in fact, we often recommend you don't do a comparative because what you're telling, I mean, what if you just look if you're a rate payer or a customer, you're looking at that list of ten utilities and you see your district is number seven, but somebody else is number one as far as they're lower than you. Right. That district's probably lower because they're not in, not investing in the system. Um, they're not investing. I mean, they could be taking a total break on, on capital. They haven't raised rates in 10 years. That may sound really nice if you're a rate, rate payer, but in the long-term sustainability of your system, that's really not the wisest choice but it looks good at the moment. It's also a very much a moment in time. And we know uh, utilities are constantly in flux on their rates. I mean, they're, they're, most of the utilities we work with do, do a rate study about every five years. Sometimes they get three years into the rate study and they stop. Sometimes there hasn't been a rate study for a long time and they're, they're kind yeah. of holding. It's hard. I, 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 you're hitting on all the reasons why. Okay. So let me ask you a question then. If you're going to go out there and get information that um, we're going to say put so many qualifiers on that you really can't do anything with that, should we be doing it at all? Do I want to get that information at all um, on this comparative analysis? Um, is the question that I want to put out there that? Uh, before you answer that, Melissa, uh -huh. let me just sound the rest of the board to see, do we want to do a comparative analysis? To Bob's point, all we're going to do is go get the usual suspects and come in. So our situations are different. Right. It's always good so, to know what other people are doing. Yeah, but, 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 if you're, but if you're going to discount no matter what they come back with for, for the following reasons, that's not applicable. So I, I wanted to ask the rest of the board. Okay. Because so, we're the ones that set the charter for Reftelis and what we're asking them to do in the form of the RFP. We approved it. No, that, we, we didn't actually ask them to do a benchmarking study, the sort that that um, Lou would like us to do. That's not their job and that's not right. part of the RFP. But it's so comparative to other districts are going out and so, seeing what other districts. I mean it's you know, you could sit down in an hour, get the rates of what, you know, the people around I mean I can I can I can do this can do and send it myself. to you tonight, right? right? I can do that myself. <laughs> okay. And so so to me this is a, a non essential question. Um, because we kind of could figure it we can kind of figure it out right now. I think to Gail's point, this is all public information. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we propose a rate increase of X percent or whatever, right. I can guarantee you that Valley Press or Banner or one of these newspapers is going to send their reporter out to go out and say, what's it cost to buy water in all these different communities? Yeah. It'll get published. And we don't have to put it in the study particularly because it's, you know, if it if it turns out that we're way out of line, some reporter is going to write this up with a story in the local paper or put it on the web. And you know, it's too easy to get the information. I, I think from the point of view of what the question you're asking is, do we need to do an in-depth analysis on that? I, I'm not sure that we do. I, I guess it would depend on if there's something they're doing cost wise or yeah. infrastructure wise to justify tiered rates, you know, that might be interesting to know. I think it would be worthwhile to have a comparison to Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz. I mean, if it takes an hour or two to do that calculation, you know, these are our rates this is what you pay in Santa Cruz and Scotts Valley for equivalent water. I think there's some value in that. Yes. Um, we, we don't, we don't have to ask a, a, re, a reporter to do that. I think that's in the interest of transparency to our, our I'm, community. I'm just saying they will, if we don't. I uh, Maybe. And, and it's worthwhile for us because somebody will bring it up. Yeah. And we should, if should nothing have the else for defensive purposes, we mm -hmm. should know that. So that if somebody comes in and says, "Oh my God, you're three times as expensive as so and so," we should all know that. Right. Yep. Yep. I okay. I completely agree. And on that. Right. 
nothing more detailed than that because we it's not an impact. <coughs> yeah, right, right. Benchmark, so. right yeah, exactly. And and again, I'm the thing I'm most curious about is what these. Uh, is what these workarounds are on um, tiered rates. I mean, one of the things I'm sensitive to is being too clever by half to try to do a workaround and find some obscure loophole by which you drive the truck through. I mean, that's not the spirit of what we're trying to do here. I mean, if tiered rates make sense for us, there should be a pretty obvious reason for why that should be. It shouldn't be that we're looking for some you know, vague loophole. Um, so I, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about what those justifications are that, that you've encountered um, uh, in the other studies that you've done. Okay. So um, with all of this input, Melissa, uh, you can come back to us in a month. What was well, that? Well, let me ask something, though. Okay. We have all said things. Right. Um, not all of it has been um, the same. In fact, we haven't necessarily agreed on everything. So when you say they take the input, what is it specifically that we are telling them to do? Um, to sort of say thank you very much for the input we've had. If there's three people that said one thing and two that said another, we'll ignore the two. We're relying on staff. What is it that we as a board are communicating formally to them as their charge and remit for what we want to see? Um, I don't have an answer to that question, but I'd like to ask Melissa, uh, what do, what's your takeaway uh, from this discussion this evening? With yes, any yes, sure. Um, but one large takeaway is that is that public outreach is very important. And um, I would like to get with staff early next week and see if we can decide on a schedule that makes sense, that accomplishes what, what the goals are for public outreach and gives you time uh, to get the input that you need for the board to feel comfortable making their decisions. And that staff can communicate that back to the board so everybody's on the same page of what that looks like. I think that would be really helpful. Um, for you. And it sounds like you're going to have some discussions about what that public outreach might look like with one of your subcommittees that you have. Um, as far as the comparative, that um, uh, we can, as one of your directors mentioned, it's a very it's a very easy comparison for us. We will just look to to your staff to give us the utilities and the and the specifics on that, and we can accomplish that. If you decide you don't want it, it's not a big deal. We're going to do that toward. The in, you know, we're not going to do that the first day because <laughs> we don't know your, what your rates are yet. Um, so, so that's something you have some time to decide on. Um, we certainly um, heard a lot from both both the public and the board um, about different things that you want to make sure we're considering. Um, we uh, have we had have someone taking notes on that. Frankly, most of what you're talking about are things that we do consider in the rate study. Um, and it's my takeaway is this is a really highly engaged board. You're going to ask us a lot of questions and we better be prepared to answer them when we come to you with our recommendations um, after vetting it with staff. Is there anything I'm missing that you'd like to make sure that we're taking care of? I don't that was great. I don't think so. No. Rick has. Uh, I would, yeah. and Melissa, we'll be able to come back to you to discuss outreach after our admin committee meeting. I think it's the first or second week in August. Yes, yeah, August 4th, right now. Yeah, so we'll we'll be able to come back with a somewhat planned kind of that that's great. And just so everyone knows, we're continuing to work. So it's it's not like we just sit and wait. So um you know, we've 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 got some things that we're doing. Um and, and that's completely fine for you all to, to take the time to do that. And we always say it's 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 best not to rush these things. It's best to have all the input, all the all the information, and for folks to feel comfortable that the process was very transparent as they go along. Okay. Uh, can I make a request? You can. Um, for the admin committee meeting, can we um, invite Miller Maxfield to be in attendance? Because I would like them to hear some of the direction that we we may want to you know start. Mm -hmm. pointing them towards in that meeting, or at least get their feedback on what we're asking them. Okay. All right. 
well, uh, the public that was here and online, thank you for your attendance. Um, and we look forward to further discussions down the line on this rest of the year. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, we've got nothing else on the agenda. I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Thank you, Melissa and yes. Thank you for the presentation. Hanging in there at all. Thank you, Thank you Eric. That's 756 adjournment. Oh, I'm good. Yeah. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you. I'll have to find out how the audience.